appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk with you all uh, a little bit. It's conceivable that I know less about Francis Schaefer than anyone in the room. I do not claim to be a Schaefer expert by any stretch of the imagination. I think I'm going to be on the panel at the end. I have one Schaefer family story that involves me a little bit that I can tell at that point, but I won't take the time to uh, tell it now. Interesting, maybe just to me. But, um, as Sam said, I, I do serve in uh, the state legislature in Kansas. I've been doing that since 2004. I've been very actively involved in politics for a, a big portion of my life. My state legislative role is a, a part time legislature, like a lot of state legislatures are. I'm an attorney. I mean that a little bit about my background. I moved around a lot when I was little, but moved to a way to Kansas when I was nine, and other than four years away for college, uh, a few years in the military, and we didn't grow into college, and I've been in a way since that point in time. I was in the Army graduate for four years, practicing the civil litigation firm, and uh, my legislative life, I chair the House Judiciary Committee in Kansas, I'm the Vice Chair of the Attractions and Human Justice Committee, and so on the U.S. Committee also in the United District right now, and so I have everybody very stressed and tired in the legislation. I make legislators more grumpy than uh, three districts, and I'm finding that out for sure. Um, what I want to try to do today uh, is maybe a little bit different than some of the other speakers who probably are quite knowledgeable with respect to uh, Francis Schaefer, and uh, instead just talk about how I, as someone who is actively involved on a day-by-day basis in the political process, and also, uh, I hope, try to be a, a serious Christian, uh, relates those things together. And uh, I'll, I'll start off by uh, a quote. Some of you who have uh, seen me speak before probably heard me use many of the quotes that I'm going to use today before, but probably my favorite quote about um, politics and politicians is from Luther. Uh, so I'll start with Luther. Luther said that princes are the greatest fools or worst criminals on earth. But they are God's fear that can hang them. It is his divine will that we should call his hangmen gracious men and be subject to them in all humility, so long as they do not overreach themselves by wanting to become pastors instead of hangmen. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit today about what it's like to be one of God's jailers and hangmen and how we think about um, what the uh, appropriate role. I'm going to speak primarily here um, see about the role of the individual Christian and less about the role of the, uh, the, the church institutionally with respect to uh, these issues. And I do think there are some important distinctions there. Um, and try to think about the question of, of how we as Christians are to view uh, the purpose of, of politics in relation to our fundamental obligation to give glory to God and attempting to think through the, uh, the, the stresses that come between those two things that can sometimes can be difficult. Um, I want to admit at the outset uh, that there is not always a, a clear answer to this question, and quite frankly, in what I would call kind of the, the pale of orthodoxy, um, people have answered this question in many distinct ways, and so the approach that I'm going to suggest today um, is certainly not the only approach, and, and I think not the only possible proper approach for a Christian to, uh, to consider, but I hope it's one that will um, at, at least it needs to be of some benefit to you as you think a little bit about it. Yeah, I think the, the tension that I explained in that question is, is very apparent as we, we look at Scripture and we can look at passages like Hebrews 11, where we are called, as we are many other places in the New Testament, strangers and exiles on the earth. I just read from that passage a little bit more. We all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them, and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But, that, but as it is, they desired a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Now, 
the tradition that I come from, which is kind of a Reformed Protestant tradition, I, I uh, look to, to Calvin sometimes for clues and cues as to how we can think about some of these passages. And Calvin, in his commentary on that verse, said um, something that I think is, is worth pondering about a little bit, and it's helpful to me. He said, but if they, in spirit, in their dark clouds, took, took a flight into the celestial country, what ought we to do at this day? For Christ stretches forth his hand to us, as it were openly from heaven, to raise us up to himself. If the land of Canaan did not engross their attention, how much more weaned from things below ought we to be who have no promised habitation in this world? So this theme, those as strangers and exiles, those who have no habitation in this world, is certainly a theme that it's not too difficult to find in, in Scripture. It's there quite clearly. And yet, we have other passages that point in perhaps a, a seemingly different direction. We can look to a passage like Jeremiah 29, and we see there, uh, in the circumstance of the Babylonian exile, that those who were in exile in Babylon were told very specifically that they were to do all sorts of things that might seem quite strange. They were to take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease. And then this, probably the oddest thing of all, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for it is its wealth and its welfare that you will find your welfare. Now, I'd like to suggest that our circumstance today is quite similar. We are exiles just as those who were, not just as, but in a similar way to those uh, who were in exile in the Babylonian captivity. And we have a similar obligation to seek the good of the city where God has placed us. I'm going to jump back to Calvin again because commenting on this, he, he drew, I think, exactly the contrast I'm trying to help us to think about a little bit here today. He said, at first these two things seemed inconsistent, that the Jews were to live 70 years as though they were natives of, that, of the place, and that their habitations were not to be changed, and yet they were ever to look forward to return. But these two things can well agree together. And the question is, I think for us, how can these two things well agree together? Was Calvin right about that? Is it possible to live as strangers and exiles, as the New Testament says that we are, while seeking the good of the city in which God has placed us without some sort of uh, cognitive dissonance that makes it very difficult to act in a coherent fashion. And, and again, um, trying to sort through what that might look like has caused a lot of uh, very smart people, smarter than me, uh, to scratch their heads and suggest a variety of different approaches with respect to what that might look like. Now, Certainly, one of the, the earliest thinkers to, to grapple with this question and to suggest an approach was Augustine. And in, in Augustine's approach, and one that I think is helpful still for us to, to consult and consider today, um, he posited this idea in the, in the city of God of, of two cities, and that's certainly distinct from uh, a, a later development of idea of, of two kingdoms and the two cities we see a very stark antithesis one city that belongs to God one city that is uh, that, that is clearly um, contrary to um, to God and his reign and then the two kingdoms situation that we talk about maybe later on in history both kingdoms are clearly God's and it's important to keep that distinction in mind as we kind of talk about some of these ideas but Augustine said something that I think is, is helpful as well by way of, uh, of introduction in, in speaking about the, the heavenly city and the earthly city. And he, he said this in, in chapter 19 of the City of God, the heavenly city avails itself of the peace of earth, and so far as, that, as it can, without injuring faith and godliness, desires and maintains a common agreement among men regarding the acquisitions of, necess of the necessaries of life and makes the earthly peace bear upon the peace of heaven. I think that little line about acting in a way that makes this earthly peace bear upon the peace of heaven is a is very, very provocative idea, and one that is, is interesting to spend some time thinking about, and certainly a lot of people have spent time thinking about 
what that might mean. Um, I want to think about that idea in the context of a, of a book written by a, a, a Roman Catholic who writes in the, the Augustinian tradition. His name's Robert Cranach, and uh, he wrote a book called Christian Faith and Modern Democracy, which I think, although I don't agree with all of the policy prescriptions that he arrives at at the, at the end of the book, I think it's a very interesting and, and thoughtful book and, and challenging, certainly, to me. And there was one quote that I've got, come back to again and again in that book that I think kind of frames this issue that I'm talking about uh, very nicely. And I'll, I'll try to I'll read that quote, focus this in on one particular part of it, and then maybe, I, I hope, spend the balance of my time kind of fleshing out what some aspects of, uh, of, his, of his statement here, I think, means or how it can be helpful to us or somebody who's trying to think about what it might mean to be a Christian who's serving in the Kansas legislature or involved in the political realm in some other way, or more broadly speaking, uh, just involved in, uh, in affairs of culture, maybe not necessarily directly politically. But um, Cronach uses the, the two cities language, picking that up from Augustine, and he says this. He says, we must learn to manage the enduring tensions of the two cities, keeping our hearts open to the beauties of the heavenly city while seeking the best possible arrangements of the earthly city, and recognize that the two orders will not be reconciled until the end of time. Living with the tensions of dual citizenship is a more difficult task than assuming an inevitable convergence of Christian faith and modern democratic life, but is the only honest course for the pilgrims of the earthly city. I hope you'll see several themes in uh, in, his, in that quote that are that, that touch on some of the things that I've talked about before. This idea of us being pilgrims or exiles, the idea of seeking the good of or the best possible arrangement of the earthly city, but doing so in a way that draws a distinction between uh, the heavenly city and the earthly city. Now, exactly where to draw those lines how to go about that, what formulation with respect to that is appropriate is a, is a vexing question, one I certainly don't have any, any final answers to, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to suggest at least a few thoughts in that regard. Um, I'll skip back here real quickly to Augustine himself. This is one more um, quote that I think uh, might be useful. In the city of, this is again from the city of God, um, in defining some of these same ideas, Augustine himself said this, the, the earthly city, which does not live by, by faith, seeks an earthly peace. The well-ordered concord of civil obedience, the combination of men's wills to attain the things that are helpful to this life. The heavenly city makes use of this peace only because it must until this mortal condition which necessitates us necessitates it shall pass away. I think again, drawing the same distinction that I've been talking about, the way in which, as we talked about before, we can try to act to make earthly peace bear upon the peace of heaven. Now, the question, I think, becomes using terminology that um, comes up sometimes in, in apologetics, is, is what is the, the point of contact, so to speak, um, between these two realms. Um, and that's a, a, a difficult question. It, it seems to me that the point of contact between the, the, the two cities we've been talking about is the ability or need for the city of God, those who are citizens of the city of God, operating as pilgrims in the temporal realm, again, to make use of the peace produced by sound administration of the city of man to aid in the advancement of the ultimate goal of beatitude, enjoyment of God. And in this limited sense, um, the city of man may act as an aid in the task of, as Karnak said, keeping our hearts open to the beauties of the heavenly city, which is to say there's a sense in which we're able to make common cause um, with those who perhaps don't share all of our goals, um, who don't or are not citizens of the heavenly city, um, in the in our work within what I would call kind of a common common culture, 
And that becomes part of the, the challenge, of course, when you're operating within the political realm um, with people who have vastly differing um, points of view, not only about issues in general, but that vastly different perspectives and life experiences that they're bringing to the political process. And so the question of whether it's possible, whether there is some sort of point of contact or common ground um, that can allow us to effectively interact with, with those folks within um, the realm of politics, uh, that's uh, at least I hope those remarks are uh, that's the way I kind of think about it, at least. And I think the, the, the core thing in going about that, the way in which I tend to be somewhat or suspect, and I may get in trouble here for saying this, but I tend to be somewhat suspect about um, conversations about a, see, I'm a lawyer, and someone would say, well, um, you need to be a, a how, how can we be, how can you be a lawyer in a way that is kind of, uh, self-consciously Christian? Um, how can you be a plumber in a way that is self-consciously Christian? And in one sense, though, I think, and, and I have, at a, at a practical level, I have some concerns about whether that language always gets used in a way that's helpful and appropriate. But from the standpoint of motives, I think there is something that we can say. Although I think it would be essentially the same answer across a wide variety of fields. So in other words, you could take something as disparate as being an attorney and being a dentist and ask what does it mean to be a Christian attorney or a Christian dentist. And um, it, from a standpoint, from a subjective standpoint, from a standpoint of motive, I think the, the extent to which we're required in all of these tasks to act based upon a, to have love for neighbor as a real motivation for what we are doing is absolutely crucial. And that is, I think, in my view at least, more helpful than trying to sometimes parse out um, exactly what it looks like in the day-to-day -day task of performing a particular profession to be a Christian and to instead ask the question from the perspective of this subjective level of what motivates me, what drives me, what brings me to this task, and particularly in the task of politics, um, love of neighbor is crucial, I think, in that regard. Um, and, and that, I think, posits a, a kind of politics that perhaps is a little bit different um, than what we, we typically see. Um, you know, in some ways, we're in a campaign season now. It's amazing we're this early in the year and we're still in a campaign, already in a campaign season and we've been in one for so long. I run on a two-year cycle, so I feel like I'm always in a campaign season as well. And it, it gets wearisome. And in some ways, it seems like it's worse than it's ever been in that regard. And this idea of, of acting with love within the political context may seem um, an impossibility. One perhaps hopeful note, I suppose, I would add is I don't know that it's really all that much worse than it's ever been with respect to the nature of the conflict. I'm driving back and forth from uh, um, Topeka. I like to listen to books on tape. I'm listening to a, a book on tape. This is a bit of an aside. I wasn't planning on talking about this, but my mind wanders sometimes. Um, the, uh, I'm listening to a book on tape about the 1800 presidential Election. I think it's, I think the title of the book is something like a magnificent cataclysm. I think is what the title of the book. When you're listening to it on tape, and you're gonna have to pick it up all the time and see the cover and forget what the title is. But I'm pretty sure that's the title. And uh, of course, these two men that we would uh, we would venerate, um, Adams and Jefferson, to see the things that they were saying about each other and their cohorts were saying about each other and. To see Jonathan Edwards' grandson, Aaron Burr, the things he was doing and saying of, of people, of all people, Jonathan Edwards' grandson, one of the great villains of American politics. So, you know, it doesn't take too many generations, perhaps, for things to, uh, to, to go awry. But the, the point there is to merely say that what we're seeing now, perhaps, is more persistent and more in our face because of the nature of technology and media. But the real difficulty, um, the tendency in every election to say this is the most important election of our lifetime. You know, I know I said that two years ago, but this time I really mean it. This is really the one that if we don't elect our guy, everything is going to end. 
I can tell you that the Federalists were definitely saying that in 1800, that the that Jefferson and his cohort were Jacobins who were going to bring kind of French Revolution to the United States. And, and on the flip side, the Jeffersonians were saying that if, if Adams were re-elected, we were a short step away from a presidency that would essentially be a monarchy. They felt that way even more about a, a possible Hamilton administration in the future than and the high federalists than they did about, about Adams. But the point is that these kind of conflicts, the kind of... Uh, ratcheting up the importance of every election, of making every political issue a, a matter of, of life and death. Um, there's nothing new under the sun in that regard. And I think in some ways that's one thing that Christians who are strangers and exiles, whose ultimate hope will never be in winning an election or losing an election, something that we can bring that's valuable to the process. But unfortunately, all too often we see exactly the opposite. I know um, I'm a Republican. I'm a conservative Republican. Anybody who wants to check out my website sometime or something can, uh, can track that if you, if you want to and can kind of see where I'm, I'm coming from in that regard. I tell people, and I, I believe this is absolutely true, that I... If people are familiar with, uh, with Governor Sebelius, who's now the Health and Human Services Secretary for President Obama, and I had more bills on which I was the chief co-sponsor vetoed by Governor Sebelius than any other member of the Kansas legislature. So my benefits in that regard are, uh, are, are, are fairly strong. But having said that, I can recall an event from around the last election with some very nice people, some very good people who had asked me to come over and participate in a little uh, prayer meeting that they were having in advance of the, uh, the election. And these folks were kind of political cohorts of mine. And uh, it was a very depressing evening for me to see um, how fearful they were um, of what the implications would be. Now, I would, guarantee, I would guess that I probably in terms of time and treasure, maybe worked harder than anybody in the room to actually try to achieve the result that they wanted. But their terror at the idea that this election was going to be lost, the, the fear that they had, the, the implications that they felt it carried with it, seemed to me very out of proportion for people who are strangers and exiles, who, whose eschatological hope uh, should be for the, the resurrection of the body and the age to come. And that does not mean, and I hope my, the, the way I spend my time and my effort and my energy would say that that does not mean that I think matters of culture, matters of politics are unimportant by any stretch of the imagination. But when we approach politics with a sense of its, of its limits, when we approach politics with a sense that our obligation, our reason for, for being in, in, in politics is not conquest or transformation or redemption, but, ma but rather, I would argue, fulfilling a role, a, a God-given role within the covenant that he gave to Noah uh, for preservation of culture, that we can approach it in a way that's a bit more detached, that allows us to be loving even to our enemies, because the stakes for us are not maybe quite as high. That doesn't mean the stakes are low. The stakes are high, but not quite as high as those who truly who for them, this life is all there is. This world is all we have. And uh, that's not the circumstance that, uh, that we are in. Um, I, having said that, um, I did want to talk about um, just for a moment more this idea, and hopefully it's becoming somewhat clear now what I'm talking about in terms of living with uh, this tension of the, the dual citizenship that, that, that we hold. And, and, and I want to not understate um, the nature of the, the challenges that we face in, in modern culture. And while 1939 may not seem that modern to, uh, to, to many of us, uh, in the grand sweep of history, it's not that long ago. And in 1939, T.S. Eliot wrote something in a, in a book called The Idea of a Christian Society, which is a book that I highly recommend. Uh, it's a very interesting book by a very interesting guy, 
Um, Elliot definitely has his foibles, there's no question about that. Uh, but this book in particular, Notes on a Def Definition of Culture, another book really worth liking, especially if you like Eliot's poetry and may not be as familiar with some of his thinking in other areas. But let me just read something that Eliot said in the idea of a Christian society and talk a little bit about how that plays into some of what I've been talking about here today, and then I'll be quiet. Maybe our other speaker will be ready to... Uh, join us by Skype, which would be kind of cool to see. Um, Elliot wrote this in 1939. The problem of leading a Christian life in a non-Christian society is now very present to us. And it is a very different problem from that of accommodation between an established church and dissenters. It is not merely the problem of a minority in a society of individuals holding an alien belief. It is the problem constituted by our implication in a network of institutions from which we cannot dissociate ourselves, institutions the operation of which appears no longer neutral, if, my editorial comment, if, if you could ever say it could be, but, but non-Christian. And as for the Christian, who is not conscious of his dilemma, and he is in the majority, he is becoming more and more de-Christianized by all sorts of unconscious pressures Pragmatism, excuse me, well, maybe pragmatism too, but paganism is what this says. Paganism holds all the most valuable advertising space. Paganism is a little worse than pragmatism. Now, Elliot goes on to suggest that within the city of man, the Christian who does recognize his dilemma must not seek to use temporal authority to create, as he calls it, a society consisting exclusively of devout Christians, but rather, and I love this, a society in which the natural end of man, virtue and well-being and community, is acknowledged for all, and the supernatural end, beatitude, for those who have eyes to see it. And I think in, in this setting up of the, the challenge that we face, not saying the reality that there are things about living in the modern world um, that are e extremely hostile to Christianity and sometimes in a way that is very subtle and that the possibility of us going along with broader cultural trends with no sense of where that's carrying us is a real one. And that's something certainly that Schaefer um, was helpful in pointing out, of drawing people's attention to. And in this sense, Elliot, I think, was saying something similar. But what I love about Elliot is that when he gets around to talking about, okay, acknowledging that all of this is occurring, that these bad things, these hostile influences are everywhere, what does our response look like? And the idea that our response to this would be something um, that at first to some may sound a little bit disappointing, I suppose, um, but the response would be working towards a society in which virtue and well-being and community is possible for all, and that there's a, the, the supernatural end of beatitude is protected then for those who have eyes to see it. Only here, I think, is still recognizing this basic dichotomy we've talked about before. Indeed, he's picking up quite directly on the Augustinian ideal familiar to the Presbyterians in the room from our own shorter catechism of beatitude as the ultimate or supernatural end for the members of the city of God. And while he, his call to virtue in the temporal realm may be more ambitious than Augustine's own hopes for what could be achieved in the temporal realm, his call for well-being and community, I think, fits very nicely with the more limited aspirations of a temporal realm where a community of affections is made possible by a well-ordered civic life that preserves peace within the social realm. And so, with all of this in mind, let me just suggest the following. I think the basis for our engagement in the public political life of our community um, might be thought of as emerging from kind of a Burkean notion, um, the English states and Edmund Burke notion, that it's true to say both that God willed the state or other institutions of common culture, but for limited ends. And it may be that an understanding, as I tried to suggest previously, 
of the vital yet limited role of politics is the great contribution that Christians can make to the political process. As those who do not believe that the temporal order is the only order, as those who do not believe that material needs are the only needs, as those who do not believe that men may recklessly do as they wish with human patrimony, we can, I think, offer a distinctive voice. Um, a, a politics of humility, a politics motivated by love, a, a politics that attempts to um, act wisely with respect to the tactical decisions we make as we work our way through the process. Um, all of these things, I think, are consistent with um, what it means, I think, to be a, a Christian actively involved in the political process. Um, I started with Luther, so I'll, I'll end with, uh, with Calvin. And this quote's a little bit lengthy, but it again captures uh, another way of, uh, of saying what I've been trying to say here today. Um, Calvin said this, Whoever knows how to distinguish between body and soul, between this present fleeting life and that future eternal life, will without difficulty know that Christ's spiritual kingdom and the civil jurisdiction are things completely distinct. Since then, it is a Jewish vanity to seek and enclose Christ's kingdom within the elements of this world. Let us rather ponder that what Scripture clearly teaches is a spiritual fruit that we gather from Christ's grace, and let us remember to keep within its own limits all that freedom which is promised and offered to us in him. For why is it that the same apostle who bids us stand and not submit to the yoke of bondage elsewhere forbids slaves to be anxious about their state, unless it be that, the, that spiritual freedom can perfectly well exist along with, with civil bondage? By these statements, he means that it makes no difference what your condition among men may be or under what nation's laws you live, since the kingdom of Christ does not at all consist of these things. Now, I worry really, about reading a quote like that at a Francis Schaeffer con conference and the concerns that I'll get ridden out on a rail. Um, but I, I do think that what Calvin points at here, what Augustine was pointing at, what T.S. Eliot was pointing at, are all, even if there are folks here who would not agree in, in entirely with the direction that those quotes suggest, um, are a helpful corrective at a minimum from the sort of triumphalism that sometimes can be found um, within uh, politics within conservative Christian circles. And I just appreciate the fact that a, a group like this would spend a Saturday getting together, thinking about some of these things, trying to think very seriously about the idea of what does it mean to be a responsible Christian in a whole host of, of different areas of life. And by no means do I suggest that I've got any of this figured out, or frankly that I've even started to begin having any of this figured out in a way that is completely appropriate. And the, the challenge of, on a day-to-day -day basis, trying to go about practicing politics in a spirit of love, practicing politics, keeping in view the limited nature of what can be achieved by it, is not the easiest thing in the world, and I probably fail at it every single day that I attempt to practice politics. I had one day this week that was particularly taxing, where I don't think I may not have thought of any of these things for a single moment in the entire time that I was uh, in Topeka and dealing with some of the, the frustrations that were that, that that I was dealing with there. But I, I would just close by saying that I, I appreciate the fact that you'd be willing to listen to me talk for a few minutes. Um, I, I do think that we can, we can have a view of politics and our role in common culture in general that at one and the same time does not denigrate the importance of our engagement in those cultural activities, but does not at the same time give a, a, a over-elevated um, sense of importance to what can be achieved through those interactions and exactly um, what folks think can be achieved and how to go about that is certainly a matter that Christians in, in good faith have differed about and will continue to differ about going forward. Uh, 
but I hope that in, in all that we do, if we engage in the realm of uh, common culture, whether it be in, in politics or our vocation or otherwise, uh, that we can keep in mind and in view uh, the reality of our status of strangers and exiles and think about uh, just what that might mean with respect to uh, our involvement in and engagement with the broader culture around us that we, of course, are are certainly a part of. So I'll, I'll, I'll close with that, and uh, again, just uh, really appreciate the chance to be able to talk to you for a little bit. So thanks.